Okay, hello everybody. The fifth day, the last day, we had a lot of nice talks. We'll have more nice talks today, of course. Somebody wants to make a comment on the football game, Alex? No. Please don't, please don't. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> well. Okay, let's dive right into science, I suggest. Or, or wait for 24, okay? <laughs> so, the next speaker is Lauren Matilski, and he will continue with the theme that Sasha introduced yesterday on confining the solar tackle client. Go ahead. Um, hello, I'm Lauren Matilski. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I just uh, finished my PhD with Yuri Tomre um, and Brad Hyman at the University of Colorado. Um, and I just started an NSF postdoc uh, at, at, in California at Santa Cruz, um, working with primarily Nick Brummel and also Pascal Garreau, uh, both of whom are experts on the solar tackle client, so I'm excited to start um, these three years. Um, I just want to say thanks to the conference organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I think it's been really great um, interacting with so many uh, professional uh, geophysical and astrophysical um, experts in magnetic fields. I think we have a lot to learn from each other and I know I've learned a lot over the last few weeks. Um, okay, I'd also like to thank my advisor, Yuri Tomre, for gently encouraging generations of grad students to pursue the solar tackle climb, and um, I was no exception, and I think in this case uh, we got some nice results. Okay, so I'll be discussing um, solar tackle climb confinement. Uh, I think Sasha did a great job yesterday introducing um, what the main uh, problem is, and I, I'll go into a little bit more detail today, um, but I'll be discussing um, tackle climb confinement in particular uh, by a dynamo, so this is a magnetic confinement scenario, and it's a dynamo that seems to originate in the convection zone, but also uh, wind its way down into the radiative interior, um, which is interesting. I'll effectively be summarizing the results from a very recent um, paper in AppJ Letters, which just got uh, downloadable, I think, two days ago, um, so you can go and check it out now. Um, okay, and then I'll be... Uh, sharing my different sections of the talk uh, down here so you can kind of orient yourself. So right now we're in the introduction. Um, and I'd say the solar tackle climb was founded around um, circa 1990. Um, Helioseismic inversions began to get good enough where we saw that the angular velocity was approaching uh, basically a constant value in the radiative interior. So we've probably seen this picture um, quite a few times this week. I won't dwell on it too much, uh, but the major takeaways from helioseismology are that we have a strong surface differential rotation, um, equator rotating about 30% faster than the polar regions, and then as we wind our way down from the surface into the interior, uh, the rotation rate increases sharply with depth in the outer 5%, that's the near surface shear layer. Um, then it remains roughly constant along radial lines, so there's strong latitudinal um, rotation contrast all throughout the convection zone. And that makes the next shear layer particularly pronounced because when we reach the base of the convection zone, um, everything goes basically toward a solid body uh, rotation. And so it seems from all intents and purposes that the hole inside of the sun, maybe, we can't really know what's happening in the core, is rotating like a solid ball. And this transition region is called the tachocline, um, which is derived from the thermocline in the ocean where things go toward the same temperature, and here they're going toward the same tach uh, speed. Um, and this location is roughly coincident with the base of the convection zone. It doesn't have to be uh, exactly coincident, but they seem to roughly lie around 70% uh, the solar radius. And the transition width, as Sasha mentioned, um, is actually not the width of the tachocline is really an upper bound, which represents the width of the helioseismic inversion kernel. And so the actual tachocline width could be substantially thinner, and we wouldn't be sensitive to that, which I think is um, important from a dynamical perspective. Okay, so I want to belabor a little bit the relevant time scales in the radiative interior, because it might be my own naivete um, and the fact that really giants in fluid dynamics have done this a lot before a few decades ago, and I tend to get confused. But I think it's kind of a subtle issue, because the worry is that we have a thin boundary layer, 
and that under the influence of diffusion, um, it would spread. And if you think about the diffusion timescales in the sun, they're actually quite long. And so I don't think it's immediately obvious why the tachocline would spread in the first place. So I want to walk through a little bit of what happens because I think it's um, relevant for thinking about these confinement scenarios and whether they're realistic or not. So from the fastest diffusion time, I'll go from fast to slow, we have the thermal diffusion time. I have the diffusion coefficients on the right, and you can do some back of the envelope math, and you can calculate that the diffusion time across the whole radiative zone um, for uh, thermal diffusion is about seven million years, which is long maybe for us, but it's not that long um, in terms of the age of the sun or stellar evolution. Next up, we have the magnetic diffusion time, which is about 20 billion years, which is getting a little bit um, longer. <laughs> And then we have a viscous diffusion time, which is the longest time scale of all, around 20 trillion years. And then we have a twist, which is that the thermal diffusion time in the sun is actually not exactly the relevant um, parameter. And this is where uh, the radiative spread of the tachocline comes in. Because if you have a thermal perturbation, um, in the case of the tachocline, it would be a thermal wind associated with a differential rotation it can't simply diffuse into a stably stratified layer because any um, warm temperature perturbation is going to induce a very strong restoring buoyancy force. And so it's effectively um, diluting the uh, kappa rad, the diffusion associated with the radiation, by a factor that winds up being um, the ratio of the buoyancy frequency to the rotation frequency, which is very large in the sun. And so instead of thermal perturbations diffusing downward on a thermal time scale, you have them diffusing downward on an Eddington sweet time scale, which is about a few hundred billion years, depending on how you calculate it. If you look at these last three time scales that I would say are relevant for diffusion of the tachocline, we're going to henceforth ignore the magnetic diffusion until the very end to make our lives a little bit more simple. Um, you'll notice that they're all substantially larger than the age of the current universe. Um, so it's not actually immediately obvious why the tachocline should spread. But I'll argue that it does spread. People uh, in here probably all argue that it should spread. And if it does spread, then the relevant time scale is going to be the shortest one um, between viscosity and the Eddington sweet time. And that ratio that Sasha mentioned yesterday is called sigma. Um, and this controls whether the thermal spread of the tachocline takes over or the viscous timescale takes over. And in the tachocline, this value is about 0 0.02, which means that the, it's definitely thermal spread um, that we would expect. OK, that was my long spiel on um, diffusion times as food for thought. Um, the other food for thought, though, is we have to get around this Eddington sweet time because we can't wait around a few hundred billion years for the tachocline to spread. And the thought is, um, in a seminal paper by Spiegel and Zahn in 1992, um, who derived the equations assuming uh, basically um, axis symmetry and um, linearity, um, they found that the circulation would burrow. Um, this is actually known from uh, geophysics literature. If you have a thermal wind, um, conducting into a stable layer, it will tend to burrow, and it will burrow hyperdiffusively. So it will go as the fourth power of the gradient, um, and the function t to the one quarter, if you look at it as a function from zero to one, spikes very quickly. And so you don't have to wait the full Eddington sweet time for the tachocline to spread. You only have to wait about 1%, um, which is the solar age. And so if you wait the solar age, the expectation is that through radiative spread, um, the tachocline should have spread from, say, a few percent the solar radius to, as Sasha said, uh, a 40 percent the solar radius. And in that case, there must be some torque in the radiative interior that is stopping, that's forcing things to rotate like a solid body and stopping the tachocline from diffusing. And if you thought the last two slides were fairly complicated, I think there's um, two possibilities, and one is that um, I tend to overcomplicate things when I get confused, and that's 
definitely a valid possibility. Um, but the other possibility is I think that this stuff is genuinely a very complicated dynamical system, even at first order. And so I think it, it's worthwhile to revisit some of this stuff. Um, and Pascal Garreau and, and her collaborators, um, Nick Brummel, uh, my new collaborator, are doing some really fundamental work to figure out um, which of these processes are really relevant in the TACA climb. And then I should mention to throw another complete wrench in things, if we think these diffusion coefficients are turbulent in some way, then I think all bets are off and we really don't know <laughs> which spreading processes are at work. Okay, that was my long spiel about why the TACA climb is such a, a complicated place and why it's the revelation that it act, the sun actually somehow manages to pull this off was surprising and why so many people were working on it. Okay, so let's assume that it, now that it does spread. Then we have two major confinement scenarios for producing the torque that should provide solid body rotation. And the first was also proposed by Spiegel and Zahn in 1992. And this is the so-called fast scenario because it involves shear instabilities, which um, typically have a time scale of uh, days to weeks, maybe years, um, but relatively rapid. And that will provide mainly horizontal turbulent mixing because it's stably stratified, there's very little vertical motion, and so that would tend to homogenize angular momentum along spheres and thereby keep things in solid body rotation. Um, Goff and McIntyre, uh, I guess six years later, um, in another seminal paper actually argued, again using references from the geophysics literature, that in fact these types of shear instabilities were not known to drive the system towards solid body rotation, but rather away from solid body rotation. So they argued that this scenario cannot be relevant and that there must be, um, I think the title of this paper was the inevitability of a magnetic field in the deep solar interior or something like that. So they argued that there had to be something magnetic in the interior, which they invoked in this case as a primordial magnetic field they assumed to be just a simple Dipole. And this would confine the tachocline on a slow time scale, namely the Eddington sweet time. Um, and the mechanism is basically the same as in Ferraro's law of isorotation. As the differential rotation goes downward, um, it will try to bend colloidal field lines, which act a bit like rubber bands. They don't want to be bent, and that will provide a Lorentz torque to counteract that spread. Um, so there's been a lot of work done to, as Sasha said, to uh, address the, um, whether this scenario is realistic in global models, in local models, um, in all kinds of different situations. And then I should mention for my case, um, there's, there's also another flavor for the magnetic field, which is the fast um, cyclic dynamo model, where the confinement would happen on the period of about 22 years. And this involves, if you assume that the solar cycle is a simple harmonic oscillator, it would um, extend down into the interior by about a magnetic skin depth. And if that skin depth could somehow be made deeper than the tachocline, which is uh, actually quite an endeavor to make that um, as thick as the tachocline, then it could actually provide the colloidal field to confine the tachocline, effectively um, having a dynamical field doing the confinement instead. And I should mention that this is the most similar um, to the case that I've been looking at in three dimensions. Okay, let's move on to um, what I actually did in this paper. Um, uh, well, first, um, sorry, one more piece of background. Um, in global models, typically it is very hard to reach an Eddington sweet time that is um, shorter than the viscous diffusion time. And uh, Sasha also got a little bit at this. Um, Yesterday, most of the global models I'm aware of are typically lying around a high stiffness, so a buoyancy parameter bigger than one and a Prandtl number of about one. And it's very hard to either make this buoyancy parameter lower, um, in which case you're getting further from the solar regime, things aren't as stiff, or make the Prandtl number um, substantially lower. And so we're a, a priori we're dealing with viscous spread um, in these global models, which is something that's important to know. Um, so we still have viscous spread, um, which will try to spread the tachocline. And to achieve a tachocline, you either have to force it to be there. Um, this was done a long time ago by um, Matt Browning with some really interesting results. 
um, I think during his PhD. Um, or you can ensure that there are very low diffusions in the radiative interior. So this is done explicitly in codes like um, ASH or, or Rayleigh, which is the code that I use. Um, or you can basically have an implicit diffusion drop that's in an ILES simulation like OILAG um, because there's very little uh, motion in the radiative interior and that will ensure low uh, viscosities. However you do this, the pro, I would say, of this approach is that you definitely get a tachyclone. Um, you cannot diffuse angular momentum inward um, and so you get something like a radial shear layer that looks quite nice. And I'd say the con of this approach is that the tachyclone is basically ad hoc. You're not addressing the confinement scenario um, and there's really no way to address the spread of the tachyclone um, because it's simply not allowed to spread. Um, and the other thing is that it will tend to be temporary. So you can only lower the diffusions by so much and if you wait a very long time, um, eventually the tachyclone will diffuse inward. So we looked at a different approach which was to simply um, allow there to be high diffusion um, and add a magnetic field. And now I'm into my, my simulation results. Okay, so we looked simply at two models. Um, the next step is gonna be to expand this parameter space, so this is basically a, a proof of concept that this works. We looked at a hydrodynamic HD case and um, an MHD case. We considered a geometry where we have the lower three density scale heights of the solar convection zone lying atop um, a stably stratified layer below and they have about the same aspect ratio. Here are our input model parameters, which I also won't dwell on because they're very far from the values we'd expect for a star. As you can see, our Rayleigh number is off by about 10 to the 12, but such is the, the tools we have at our disposal. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that our buoyancy time is also very high. Uh, we actually pick a buoyancy, um, sorry, a buoyancy frequency um, roughly near the solar value. So that buoyancy parameter, um, it's, it's a very stiff system. Um, we achieve Reynolds numbers of around 30 to 50. Um, so I wouldn't call these turbulent necessarily, but they're definitely nonlinear um, and they're three-dimensional. Um, for these models, they use the Rayleigh code, which uh, is quite similar to ASH. Um, so this is a typical um, simulation, which uh, it's a little bit choppy, I realize now, because I'm on Zoom. Um, but the main thing is it's anelastic, and so you have broad, um, uh, slow up, up wells and narrow, fast um, downflows. Um, this is a code with, that was originally developed by Nick Featherstone in Boulder. It's now open source. Um, lots of people, including myself, contribute to it. Um, you can download it uh, at the GitHub page, and it's a really great tool for simulating convective problems in spherical geometry. Um, okay, so in this model we had um, basically a dynamo with convective overshoot. I ran an, I'll primarily be talking about the MHD case because it's the most interesting one. Um, and in the MHD case, well also the, uh, the um, HD case, the flows plunge below the overshoot layer. So typically in these plots um, I will plot three lines, you can stop and clarify if you forget what they are, um, but the black line is the base of the convection zone, the green line is the base of the overshoot layer, which is very thin because we're quite stiff, and then um, this kind of magenta line is the base of the tachocline because the MHD case actually achieves the tachocline. And what you can see is that the vertical flows, here I'm plotting um, the velocity amplitudes for R, theta, and phi, um, just plunge by a huge amount um, about six orders of magnitude as you cross this overshoot layer and then down into the tackle climb. And the horizontal flows plunge too, but I'll put this in bold um, because I think it's significant. Um, the horizontal flows remain of a quite high amplitude. And this is not the first time this has been observed. Um, and I'll argue at the end that actually we should really look into this because it seems like in this case, these horizontal flows are driving a dynamo. Um, and if that's actually a possibility, and other global models might be driving a dynamo in their stable layers, that would be a very interesting thing to investigate. Um, we also have a magnetic field because we're a dynamo, and so here are the magnetic field amplitudes. They're definitely the strongest in the convection zone, 
they peak maybe in the overshoot layer, um, and then they fall off not quite as much as the velocities, but they fall off in the radiative interior, but um, they're still fairly strong. And I'll argue that there's actually some form of dynamo um, happening in the stable layer. Okay, um, the main result of this paper was that in the MHD case, we had a statistically steady, um, something that looked like a tachycline. And here is the differential rotation associated with the HD case. Um, it's viscously diffused all the way into the radiative interior. And in the MHD case, when you're averaging over long time scales, so it's also a cycling dynamo, so you have to average over many dynamo cycles, um, you get something where the radiative interior is completely rotating like a solid body. Of course, the differential rotation in the convection zone is greatly reduced too, but the overall shear layer from a meridional perspective looks, I would say, tachycline-like. This situation remains steady for the, the longest relevant um, time scale in the system, which is the magnetic diffusion time. We're at parental number of four. Uh, and so in a statistical sense, this is really sitting there for a very long time, about 10 diffusion times. Um, if you look at the rotation rate as a function of, along radial lines, then you can see the more non-solar-like aspects of the simulation a bit clearer. So I just want to say we're in no way claiming to have solved the confinement problem. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, how do we get the differential rotation in the convection zone right while force and solid body rotation in the interior, I think, is very much an open question. Um, but I think this is an important step because, um, as far as I know, this is the first time something like this um, has been observed in a fully three-dimensional global model. So we know that the magnetism is actually confining the tachocline because we ran one case um, with no magnetic field that did not have a tachocline, and we ran one case with a magnetic field that did have a tachocline. But this is explicitly showing it. So um, the way this works is a bit complicated because the dynamo is non-axisymmetric. Um, if you look at magnetic fields, here I'm showing the horizontal magnetic fields first at the base of the convection zone um, and then deeper down um, in the radiative interior. Um, they're primarily composed of M equals one um, or two, depending on where you are. Um, I've been calling these partial wreaths, for lack of a better word. There's probably a word for them. I haven't, I unfortunately don't know exactly what they are uh, in terms of the variety of instabilities that can produce M equals one or two. Um, so I've been calling them partial wreaths, and there's either two of them or four of them, depending on whether you have M equals one or two. And the wreaths goes back to Yuri Tomre and um, Ben Brown, um, who simulated these dynamos uh, about a decade ago with these wreaths wrapping all the way around. Mine only wrap a little bit of the way around, so maybe they shouldn't be wreaths. Anyway, um, you can see a lot more about uh, what these things do in the cycling sense in a different paper that I have with Yuri um, from 2020. Um, in terms of the field morphology, though, the, they link both zones. You have choppier field near the base of the convection zone, but clearly this roughly similar magnetic structure is present in the radiative interior as well. And if you look at um, the two non-axisymmetric horizontal fields, you can actually hopefully convince yourself that they are providing a poleward angular momentum transport, which is thus confining the tachocline. Um, the way you can do this is you can multiply them together. So B phi multiplied by B theta will give this product, which is proportional to the latitudinal um, uh, momentum flux associated with the Maxwell stress. And uh, in a longitudinally average sense, this is a positive in the north and negative in the south. So that is sending angular momentum poleward. The viscosity wants to drive a uh, equatorial jet into the radiative interior. And so this magnetism is removing that angular momentum. Um, this is more explicitly showing you that the, it's actually the magnetic torque that is confining the tachocline. Um, so what I've done here is taken this um, highlighted region, which I realize I now dragged the highlighted region away. Anyway, the highlighted region is the tachocline. Um, and if you take the torque balance in the tachocline, there's basically three torques that can be there. There's the magnetic torque, the viscous torque, 
and a torque from everything else, which I'm just going to call the inertial torque um, because it's small and we won't really care about it. Um, you can plot the torques as a function of latitude, and you see this equatorial jet from the viscosity. It's trying to speed up the equator, slow down the latitude regions, and it's completely um, counterbalanced by the magnetic torque. The inertial torque is basically uh, negligible. Um, and what you can further do is you can break apart this magnetic torque into its contributions from the m equals one and two fields. And if you want to see me do a bunch of math, I can show you how to do that. But you take Fourier transforms and only some of those um, transforms when multiplied together in this quadratic actually give you a torque. And you can basically assign um, the components of this torque to different m values. And what you can see, which is quite remarkable, I think, is that all, almost all the magnetic torque is from the m equals one and two fields. Maybe it's may, maybe not so remarkable, because if you look at the fields, they're fairly smooth in the radiative interior. But it really works quite well. And that makes our life a little bit easier, because there's only two spectral modes that we have to worry about when we look at the magnetic torque. Um, the other thing that we can see is that well, first of all, if the torque is primary fr primarily from m equals 1 and 2, um, for example, not from m equals 0, um, then that means that although these fields are non-axisymmetric, they're highly in phase in longitude, or they're in phase enough to yield an m equals 0 torque. So you have non-axisymmetric fields multiplying together to make an axisymmetric torque. Um, the other thing you can do is play the same game in frequency. So I, what I haven't told you yet is that the dynamo is cycling. Um, well, it is cycling. And it's a bit hard to see what's happening because you can't make a butterfly diagram because it's not axisymmetric. So instead, what I've done is taken the w m equals 1 component of the field and then plotted the real part of this. So you're getting phasing information about the m equals 1 field. Um, and then I've plotted this in time radius um, instead of time latitude. Um, and so what you can see is that the polarity associated with this m equals 1 structure is flipping um, about every 500 rotation periods. Um, and if you decompose the field into its different frequency components, just by looking at this, you can see that it's a fairly complicated cycle. There's not just one um, frequency component. Then you actually find that all the different frequency components are working to confine the tachocline. And so what this means is that um, this magnetic torque, which has a latitudinal profile like this on the left, um, the, if you break that up into a different frequency contribution, you take a latitudinal strip. Each one of these strips seems to basically have the same sign structure as the total torque. And so what that means is that each frequency component separately is working to confine um, the tachocline. Um, physically, it means that the fields are in phase in time. And I think this is relevant because um, this is something like a fast um, confinement scenario, as we'll see the field is diffusing downward. But this really extends the parameter space of that fast scenario, which originally was just an axisymmetric single cycling um, field to a wider parameter space. Um, and it also means that the skin depth might not be so clear because we don't know which frequency component we should be using for the skin depth if the solar dynamo has multiple frequencies, which it does. It's not a regular cycle. Um, anyway, I think this is food for thought on the fast MHD scenario. OK, um, I'll, uh, I want to wind up pretty soon. Um, so why do I think there's a deep dynamo? Well. First of all, there is diffusion, and so the diffusion is certainly doing something. And so this is kind of like a fast scenario um, in the sense that the field seems to start, depending on when I look at this plot, I think differently, but I think it starts in the kind of near the base of the convection zone, maybe starts higher up, but there's a little jump here, so I'm not so sure. But it starts here and then seems to go downward with a slope. And if you calculate that slope, first you can calculate a skin depth associated with the primary dynamo cycle of 500 rotations. Um, and you get something that's like 0.1 r sun, which is roughly coincident with how far the field gets, except the field actually goes quite a bit further. So I'm not sure if this is the full picture. 
and then the velocity associated with that skin depth, how quickly the oscillating field would spread linearly um, is, is in line with the slope that you see from the time radius plot. And uh, like I said before, um, is the skin depth all that there is? And because it's an irregular cycle, um, I think defining the skin depth is complicated. Um, so to really get at this issue, we have to look at the production of magnetic field. Um, and this is where I, the paper becomes a little bit more speculative because it turns out it's sort of difficult to analyze the induction equation when things are non-axisymmetric. So what I did to make them uh, scalar so I don't have to worry about the non-axisymmetry is I just look at the magnetic energy equation. Um, so first I looked at the toroidal magnetic field production. This is nothing really new. Um, basically what happens is you can look at the um, energy budget uh, as, um, as Steve said a, a few days ago, there's only two terms in the magnetic energy equation. There's an inductive term and a diffusion term. And so that's this uh, blue line. So this is inductive production of toroidal field and then diffusive production. Um, and also uh, you can break up the induction into different bits. Um, and you, you can find that the production of toroidal field in this time average is uh, by the shear, which is not a surprise. There's some residual shear in the radiative interior, and this is in fact how we expect this confinement scenario to work because the poloidal field lines are um, getting bent to form a toroidal field, and that's providing a, a torque. This is consistent with Ferraro's law, with Goff and McIntyre, with, with everyone. Uh, and the really interesting thing, I think, um, is that we also see inductive production when we look at the poloidal field. So in the fast scenario, the poloidal field is purely entering the radiative interior via diffusion. Um, and in this case, uh, it actually seems to getting, be getting produced inductively. So the blue line is positive everywhere and the, and the diffusion is negative on long time scales. So there's, it's complicated because there's some sort of form of skin effect allowing the field to kind of penetrate to a skin depth, but it also seems to get much further down. Um, and this is by some inductive process. And I'm just kind of scratching the surface of this. You can look at the different components, um, but basically it, it's compressive um, deep down and it's associated with the horizontal velocities. And um, the induction has to be associated with the horizontal velocities really because that's all there is um, in a stable layer. And so this is the suggestion of the paper that there's some sort of form of deep dynamo action um, in the stable layer. And this isn't proof by any means, but I think it is important to note that I th if you look at different plots from different um, uh, global MHC simulations with the stable layer that don't have high diffusion, so there the field shouldn't be allowed to diffuse into the radiative interior, it seems to somehow occupy the radiative interior anyway. And we can argue about um, how far that actually is going. Um, I've, been I've been saying, oh, it looks like it's going pretty far down and um, maybe it doesn't go as far as I think it does. But I think there might be something worth looking into. Um, in particular, the, in the uh, Millennium simulation, um, I think later in a paper by Lawson, it sort of seemed to suggest maybe there's some kind of alpha effect going on. Food for thought. Um, okay, I'll wind up in just a second. Um, if the induction is getting produced by horizontal motions, well, where are the horizontal motions coming from? And I just wanna say that these horizontal motions are not a surprise. Um, so the fact that the velocities drop off only slowly in the radiative interior is, um, I think, expected from earlier work. It happens in our HD case, so it's not purely a magnetic phenomenon. It happens in our MHD case, um, happens in OILAG MHD models, it happens in ASH models. Um, and I think there's really some work to be done, done to figure out um, why these horizontal motions are there. Um, so, uh, Lucy Alvan with um, Sasha Brun did a really nice paper where they looked at the vertical motions and found that they were just a beautiful, rich spectrum of gravity waves. Um, but I don't think they're gravity waves for the horizontal motions. And in our case, they're actually uh, seem to be Rossby waves, which is another <laughs> interesting feature of this model. So I won't go too much into this plot because Catherine's actually gonna give a talk later. Um, 
on, on how these Rossby waves look. But basically, there's a dispersion relation associated with equatorial Rossby waves. These are the black dots. And if you look at the power, um, that lines up basically perfectly in the deep interior. So for us, it's Rossby waves. For other people, I'm not as sure. And I'm, um, that's one of my main takeaways is that we should look at the origin of these motions. OK, so to wind up, I have two uh, conclusion slides. First is I would argue that there's really three sources of magnetism in the solar radiative interior that could potentially work to confine the tachyclone. And so the first scenario is that it's already there. Um, this is the primordial field from Goff and McIntyre. In that case, you have to worry about confining it to remain there, but that's a whole other issue. Um, the other case is it diffuses down. And you might say, wait a minute, the magnetic diffusion time is 20 billion years. I can't diffuse down. And that's true, but if the relevant dynamics is taking place, say, not across the whole uh, the whole radiative interior, but say the tachocline width or a little bit more, so 0.2 because it makes the numbers very pretty. Um, then the magnetic diffusion time is actually only 800 million years, which is something that could be dynamically relevant. And furthermore, the time scale associated with radi um, radiative spread is on the same order of magnitude. So if these different frequency components can all work together, and if you're not confined to a skin depth, but instead to a diffusion depth, then I'd argue that the molecular diffusion of magnetic field actually could be relevant. And then the third um, situation that I think we should think about is could there be some sort of alpha effect um, or dynamo action deep in the interior? Okay, and that's basically um, it. So to summarize what we did in this paper, um, we expanded, I think, the validity of the fast MHD scenario in the nonlinear 3D simulation. Um, we expanded it to non-axisymmetric magnetic fields with irregular cycles. Um, and the kind of uh, very speculative questions that I'd like to leave you all with is in the sun or a star in the stable layer, could there be um, a deeper than a skin depth magnetic diffusion? Uh, could there be deep horizontal motions? Um, and finally, could there be deep um, dynamo action? So. With those thoughts, I will uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lauren, for the fascinating talk. I'm sure there are many questions. Yes, start so Steve. And it's time for my exercise. I can see that. Thank you, Lauren. That was a very nice talk. So it's, this fast scenario is good because it relies on the AC component of the field. But I'm just wondering, given Sasha's talk yesterday, which said if you have a, you know, a steady dipole in the, in the interior, which is not changing, can, can this kind of overcome the tendency of you know, things wanting to come in and giving you Ferraro's law of isorotation if you do have a steady dipole as well? I mean, maybe you could write a paper saying on the lack of inevitability <laughs> of a... <laughs> of the, right. the inevitability of a lack, it should be, shouldn't it? Yeah, of a method. <laughs> Um, well, I think it, uh, okay, first of all, I cannot tell a lie. Um, Steve told me I, he was going to ask this question yesterday. <laughs> Just, I spent some time thinking about this. Um, I think uh, it depends on which field um, is strongest. And what I've learned from this whole experience is that poloidal field lines really don't want to be bent. And they will do whatever they can to not be bent. Um, and in the axisymmetric case, you're left with kind of a residual freedom where the differential rotation can actually spread along um, poloidal field lines. And the worry with Goff and McIntyre is that if you don't confine the poloidal field to the interior, then you could have the field lines extend into the convection zone, um, thereby they would work to um, spread the tachocline. Um, I, I think actually uh, Antoine and Sasha sort of found this happening. Um, I think uh, if, I think that would be a worry if the interior dipole field is, is stronger than whatever is coming in from above, and if it's axisymmetric. Um, I think it's, it's unclear exactly how, you need the fields to be horizontal. <laughs> you, 
is the main thing. And if they diffuse into the convection zone, they're no longer horizontal. If you're near the pole and you have a dipole, there's this polar pit because they're non-horizontal. In my case, they're largely horizontal, which is nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that was. Yeah, um, and what I could do, and I haven't done, is just put a poloidal field in there. <laughs> See what happens. Just a note on your interpretation. You, you, you've got this dynamo driven by horizontal flows. Isn't yeah. there an anti-dynamo theorem that forbids that? Yes. Um, so this is not a complete um, dynamo loop. So if there were no convection zone, I don't know if, I, I don't think I would say confidently that this would be possible. Um, but because we have fields getting produced in the convection zone and in the overshoot layer, that's going to allow some, um, you know, seed magnetic field to get then get amplified. Um, yeah. And then I don't think I don't I think if you don't have to close the dynamo loop, then I think you can have horizontal motions, maybe amplifying field. Yeah. But, but interpreting it as a dynamo in that region has to be wrong. I interpret it as dynamo action. Or dynamo <laughs> amplification. But the, 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 it's the, not a no. It's not a complete dynamo. I, this is different than like a. Um, I mean, there's an anti-dynamo theorem which forbids it. So, so yes. Yeah. So it's 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 the. Of course, you've got stuff coming from above, so it's a dynamo. But that, that interpretation can't, can't be right. Yeah, I. I'm sorry if I was misleading. I don't think there's a a, a dynamo by itself in the radiative interior. That's that would be wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Very, very nice talk. Uh, to go a bit in the direction of Steve's question, do you think if you had a stable wrath not reversing but still being pumped into your uh, upper tackle client, you would still see some confinement? Or do you think the cyclic aspect of your simulation is very important here in your scenario? Right. Um, I think if you're non axisymmetric, it's Okay, so the reason that, for example, in Ferraro's law, you're, um, you're allowed some residual differential rotation, and that gets broken if you're non-axisymmetric, because effectively you can't, um, if you're a gradient, you can't face in two directions at once. Um, and I think the same, I think even a further constraint is provided by the cycling. Um, so I think a steady field could do it if it was non-axisymmetric. Um, if it's axisymmetric, then I think you run back into the Ferraro's law issue all over again. Actually, I wonder, because Sasha showed a case yesterday where you imposed a horizontal dipole, right? That seemed to have the right ingredients that you require, except it's not cyclic, right? Is that a similar picture? Sasha, what would you say? Well, you, mean, um, you mean when I did the... Yes, um, yes just at the dipole, end, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. This didn't seem to be working much because it didn't have n equals zero, so it was uh, we could not um, um, start the Taylor instability until you were building up and uh, uh, n equals zero field. So it was uh, so we didn't run that simulation long enough to see what yeah. will be the final outcome. You know. But you're saying you don't need m equals zero. M equals one and two. That's what you need, if I understood correctly, right? Um, that's what. It well, the Lawrence talk, at least, that uh, seems yeah, to be Yeah, I mean, I th that's what I'm finding. So it would be interesting to look at Sasha's case again. Um, so now I have to go all the way to Yuko. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, so can you explain a bit about the physics behind the favors the dynamo mode at m equal one and two predominantly. Um, yes, but it's rather um, speculative um, at the moment. Um, I think it's yeah. I'm gonna I'm kind of gonna kind of wave my hands here because actually in the other paper with Yuri we had this non axisymmetric case, but we also had an axisymmetric case. And so we had this really nice thing that was just cycling with a nice butterfly diagram, and then all of a sudden it turned into this non-axisymmetric m equals 1 
component, which we sort of attributed to changing symmetries between even and odd about the equator, but the answer is um, I think we really, we really don't know. I need to look into which models are actually relevant in the, in the nonlinear um, situation. Okay, there seem to be no more questions. I have one more, but you can already set up, Alex, if you, if you may. <laughs> so I wonder, you talked about uh, cyclic behavior, maybe some dynamo action in the radiative zone. So I wonder how much solid body rotation there really is, and, and, and what is the additional component that you see? Is it changing with time? And is helio seismology sensitive to that? Right. Um, so in my simulation, it is not, it's not um, fixed in time, it's fixed in a statistically steady sense. So there is um, some residual rotation that it can flop between the different hemispheres. As far as whether something like this, so in the sun we have to worry about the non axisymmetric magnetic field, but for the differential rotation, in my case the oscillations are, have an amplitude of about three nanohertz or what, maybe five nanohertz. Um, I don't That's know. Very fast. <laughs> um, wow. I don't know how. I, I don't know what the sensitivity. Okay. I think that's in the within the error bars of the. Yeah, maybe Jurgen. Maybe, maybe someone knows. Well, 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 I think that would be marginal to detect uh, at that point. It depends on time scale, because if you uh, to, to get the high sensitivity, you have to observe uh, analyze a long time series. So what was the time scale of variation of this uh, flow field? It looks like about the dynamo cycle, which in my case was a few hundred rotations. A few hundred years? Yeah. Uh, okay, so but, it's, yeah, yeah. So it, it should be there. And it's sort of, but how you would separate that from, from uh, rotation is really. With, so so you have a an, an, an non axisymmetrical structure, of course, or would it? Um, because otherwise it would just be part of rotation and then you can't do much. Sorry, maybe I don't, uh, if there's a non axisymmetric Yeah, that, that, that would be hard to see. Oh, the, if there's a non axisymmetric rotation profile. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, well, it, there's variations, all the variations I've been looking at are in the axisymmetric yeah, okay. rotation. Um, there are like the M, M equals one and two because they have to be there. Um, yeah, I, I would have to discuss what those amplitudes. I, I, I don't know those amplitudes. Right. Yeah. No. We, we should look at that. Yeah. Because it's certainly interesting. It would, would be interesting to look for if, if you could find a way to distinguish it from rotation. Yeah. Um, that no. Actually, I, that's I, the issue. I'd say first I want to make sure that this thing is realistic <laughs> before. Anyway. Okay. So thank let's you. thank Lauren again. And, thank you. Okay, and now Alex will bring us down to earth yes. and talk about large-scale motion in the core.